So shall we start? Well, my name is Kyung Wook Ho, and I'm now working as a visiting professor at the KDI uh, School of Public Policy Management. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be a moderator for this session. As you can see, the title is basically WTO versus Mega FTAs. And I think we are very lucky to have four distinguished panelists today. All four of them, I have a chance to introduce uh, all of them, but they uh, have been involved directly or indirectly for many uh, negotiations about this trade. Uh, they all know each other very well. So it's a great honor to have these four distinguished guests. The theme, you know, today we've been talking about mostly about the political situation or geopolitics, but maybe it's time to switch gears and talk about a little bit about economics. And the theme of this 2014 plenum was the future of the history. And if we know anything about the future of the history in terms of the trade and economics, it's that trade is the backbone not only for the economic prosperity, but also for the security as well as the peace. As you can see, before the uh, First World War, uh, we have a trade volume to GDP around 14%. And during the First and Second World War, as you can expect, it drops down to 5%. And after uh, the end of the Second World War, we have built up with the GATT system, and later uh, it changed into the WTO. And sure enough, right now, we have a trade volume to GDP around 33%. But it's unfortunate that this WTO, which started with all these hopes and expectations, did not achieve really anything in terms of the Doha round. And of course, there is a, a, some breakthrough in terms of the Bali agreement at the end of the last year. But in the meantime, we begin to see many FTAs. It's a really mushrooming of FTAs. And more recently, more noteworthy is the emergence of so-called mega FTAs in terms of the, you see TPP or TIPP or RCEPs in the Asian region. So what is the relationship with this you know, mega FTAs and the WTO? Basically, the question is that whether this mega FTA is something as a second best or sort of a building block to the multilateral WTO system or is more like a, a stumbling block so that the, the international trading system is now going back to a patchwork of all this regional uh, uh, system rather than the multilateral system. That's the question we would like to address. So let me just introduce uh, four panelists. Right now on my left is uh, Professor Chong ying gyo who is a uh, professor of economics at the Ina University and director of the Chong Sok Research Institute. He's currently a member of the Advisory Committee on Trade Negotiations in the Korean government. It goes along, uh, there's a long list of books and research paper, but I just want to say that he has been involved in most of the Korean trade negotiations and a chief advisor for all major uh, trade decisions. So that's uh, Professor Chung ying -gyo. And on his left is Dr. Lee ho Sok. He's the director of the European Center for International Political Economy. Uh, SAP, is that the acronym? SAP. And he's named one of the 20 most influential people for open internet by the UK's Guardian in 2012. He worked at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He served as the EU presidency chairperson in Geneva to the WTO. And he graduated from London School of Economics and Harvard University. And the third left is uh, Mr. Troy St Strangeron. He's a senior director of Congressional Affairs and Trade at the Korean Economic Institute. And he was a counsel on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellow. And he worked on the Capitol Hill for Senator Robert Torricelli on issues relating to foreign affairs and trade. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Yoshino Naoyuki. He's a dean of the ADBI in Tokyo. He's a currently the senior advisor for the Financial Research Center in the Japan Financial Service Agency as well as the Professor Emeritus at Keio University. And he served as a chair of many committees under the Ministry of Finance. So he also uh, uh, he got his uh, BA in economics from Dohoku University and PhD in economics from Johns Hopkins University. So the rule of the procedure is the same as the before. We'll give each 
gentlemen about five minutes for presentation. And after that, we'll open up the discussion among the panelists. And we hope we can have around 15 minutes later uh, for questions and answers uh, with the audience. So Professor Zhang, will you start? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for a uh, very kind introduction uh, about uh, myself. Uh, I, I would like to, to start with uh, a brief review between uh, the relationship between uh, multilateralism versus uh, regionalism. Uh, in the times of GATT, uh, definitely uh, multilateralism was uh, major in shaping uh, global trade. But uh, in the 19, uh, middle of 1990s, there was uh, some, some discussions uh, uh, between uh, multilateralism versus uh, regionalism. Then after then, even the WTO uh, accepted that uh, regionalism, uh, growing numbers of uh, FTAs in the world, uh, could contribute to the development of uh, multilateralism. After then, now we, we are uh, seeing uh, uh, several uh, mega FTAs in the world, uh, as mentioned by Chairman uh, Mr. Hur, uh, TTIP, which is uh, uh, FTA between uh, European Union and the United States, and uh, definitely the, the most important for, for East Asian country could be uh, TPP, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement. So in the, in the past, we, we saw some, some completing issue between uh, multilateralism and regionalism. Now we, we say uh, uh, emergence of mega FTA will be critical uh, in shaping uh, global trade uh, rules in future. Uh, it is known that uh, uh, TPP countries are trying to, to adopt uh, uh, some, some advanced uh, uh, trading rules, uh, especially for intellectual property rights and uh, uh, government procurement, uh, some for uh, state-owned enterprises. But I, I would like to, to raise uh, some questions. Whether these mega FTA will be, be realized in the future. Uh, TTIP between EU and the USA, it's, it's almost stopped there. Uh, TPP, the member countries uh, passed uh, their uh, target date for the conclusion of negotiation several times. Definitely this year, uh, not very optimistic for concluding the, the, the negotiation for the TPP. Uh, so theoretically, mega FTAs could be important uh, in, in dealing uh, uh, new type of uh, uh, trade rules uh, in the times of, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, that DDA. Uh, however, uh, we, it, it is not feasible for the world economy to see, uh, to see the, the establishment of uh, uh, mega FTA. Uh, I, I, I have been uh, working on uh, uh, in concluding uh, several FTAs uh, on behalf of government Korea. It is very, very difficult to uh, conclude the negotiation, even uh, for uh, even uh, bilateral FTAs. Uh, if you look at uh, history of, uh, the recent history of uh, uh, RTA FTAs in the world, there is a, you can't find uh, any FTA, I'm going to say high quality FTA uh, with uh, 10 more member countries, more than 10 member countries. So that, that implies uh, 
the difficulties of mega FDA. In order to, to achieve uh, mega FDA, we need a very strong leadership. But uh, even in the, the TPP, uh, we do not see strong leadership, uh, especially by United States. Let me stop here. Okay. Mr. Well, Lee? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, before I start, I, I, I would like to remind that there is a very ambitious FTA, which is called the European Union, which we managed to do within 28. So it is actually possible. And uh, anyway, uh, I, I would like to start by saying the, um, the, the question whether there is an inbuilt dichotomy between uh, the multilateral system and the bilateral order is a slightly misguided one. We have always done both. The question is, wh wh where do you actually put your pro policy priority right now? And it's going towards the bilateral. And the reason I say this is basically there are two sides of the same coin. They just fulfill two different policy objectives. And let me get back to that later. But basically, when it comes to the bilaterals, we have always done them. This is not something new. Uh, if you look at, for instance, the European Union, we have basically used that to stabilize our regional policy in the neighborhood with the North Africa and the Eastern Partnership. And so it has been a sort of a more like, an, let's say, a development and regional cohesion strategy from the United States. It's fulfilled a very clear strategic objective. You don't do an FTA with Morocco. You don't do an FTA with Israel if you think trade is going to be the number one priority because this country doesn't even fulfill the top 25 in the uh, US trade partners. So in that sense, I would like to say that nothing much actually have changed. The narrative is pretty much the same. Number one, we need if especially from the side of the Europe, which is now currently in a Euro crisis, export-led growth is pivotal. It's instrumental, and which means that actually it's not really a problem that our economy is declining. As long as we have an unfettered market access to those who have growth, then we can actually uphold our industrial capacities. The second question is about economic statecraft, which is actually impossible to pull off without preferential agreements. It's actually fundamentally built on that premises. And I believe this is the reason why we have TPP, which includes Japan. And it fulfills a very clear strategic perspective. And going on, and there is also a misconception that basically the things that we can do in bilaterals can actually be done in Geneva. That's simply not true. Uh, because if you look at the agenda of the Doha round and the multilateral system, they just simply don't fulfill the same level of ambition as you were saying before. And this is especially true on emerging markets and services. And also, uh, already in 2004, 2005, we started to actually think that the WTO was missold. It was actually oversold on the wrong premise. So we knew that the red lines were basically crossing and we couldn't actually conclude it. And I would like to say that WTO will probably not conceive new liberalization. And if you are actually very, very frank about it, the multilateral system post-Uruguay round, since the creation of the WTO, it hasn't actually liberalized one dollar of trade except in information technology. That's the ITA agreement on information technology goods, uh, which I happen to have in my lab, is the only tariff cut that we actually managed to agree on. So the, uh, the fundamental problem that we see, for instance, in the Bali package uh, that was agreed and once again oversold is very clear. There is no market access. There is actually no trade facilitation in the trade facilitation package. And people who would actually benefit from it most, basically the developing countries, they oppose it most. So if the biggest beneficiary oppose it, why are we making that effort? But I would like to say that WTO still plays a role, number one, as a dispute settling system. And it's also a least common denominator of what we can agree in a multilateral context. And let me rephrase that differently. It's actually an FTA for us who cannot do an FTA with China. It's a subsidy. If we would actually rename WTO FTA with China, I think there will be a much bigger interest in this. <laughs> And so the key benefits of TTIP and TPP, as we all know, it goes beyond the WTO trade issues and the agenda. And um, 
especially a lot of people ask me about regulatory cooperation. And uh, there's a fundamental problem here, which uh, number one, which is that we are now moving into an era where, whether you're talking about TTIP, TPP, or EU-Japan FTA, which is very often forgotten in this context. You're talking about a trade agreement between countries who have more than five uh, trillion in GDP. Uh, we are also talking about countries who are basically uh, non-discriminatory legal systems. So we are not actually talking about non classic non-trade barriers. We are talking about regulatory divergences. So how do you actually make two non-discriminatory systems compatible? This has turned out to be much, much more difficult than we envisaged. And I don't think I will be spilling any beans. I live in Brussels. I talk to the negotiators of TTIP every day of the week, literally. And there, will, there is a fundamental overbelief in that we will deliver mutual recognition, high-level FTA. If you actually look at the content of TTIP and also TPP, uh, to the extent people outside the negotiation room are aware of the content, it looks not that much more ambitious than a chorus or EU Korea FTA, the real templates of the FTA, the FTAs that we see in this current wave. So the convergence of the regulatory system, uh, we, we shouldn't put too much faith in this. We, there is actually no, I believe that these FTAs are too big to fail which also means that we are probably leaning towards an uh, easy way out. And uh, to be honest, uh, I, I hear, uh, for instance, a couple of weeks ago I was in uh, another similar setting to this, which is organized by another think tank, uh, which is uh, Washington DC based in Brussels, and uh, where the NATO um, Secretary General was talking about the number one instrumentation against the crisis in Ukraine which he explained was TTIP. TTIP or TPP is not going to solve the security problems we have in the world. And if it could, we would be in a really deep problem because United States and EU has been argued by chloride chicken for 15 years. I mean, if that's the truth, you know, Yanukovych and Assad will be ruling the planet by now. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so this has, furthermore, uh, still, a deep implication which has a security bearing. And one is the question about China. Because this is actually goes back to the question about economic governance and the leadership. Because I think the trading system mirrors security policy very often. It's very often an extension of security policy, uh, which is the reason we started the FTAs in the first place. And there is a big change, uh, actually two. Number one is that the United States actually decided to abdicate in Geneva. It did so voluntarily. It did not do so in the area of security, but it actually did so voluntarily in the area of trade. They decided to go to another route. The United States still have the political capital. It still sets the agenda. It still sets the sequencing of the negotiation, despite not being the biggest trader, simply because the European Union doesn't have the trust to lead. China who is the biggest beneficiary of the international trading system, doesn't want to lead. It still sees itself as a developing country, and it doesn't, most of all, it doesn't have the trust of the other BRICS country who are now pulling the brakes uh, in the trading system. So, basically, what we are now is that we know that China must open up, and it's starting to become almost like a chicken race in almost every front. Uh, we know that China is forced to do unilateral liberalization. It has to get rid of its investment caps. The question is, will it do it so unilaterally or in a trade agreement? Let me just exemplify. China's share, uh, services share of China's GDP is only 43%. In European Union and the United States and in Korea, it's very close to 80. When it comes to the economic development into services and basically the next phase of uh, industrialization, China is still a least developing country in class of Ghana. And that is setting a glass ceiling. So we know that China is going to liberalize, but the question is where? And so for, um, uh, for that, um, the perspective I think 
Korea, as well as Japan and the Europe and United States, is very clear. We need to set, not necessarily multilateral, but at least an international order based on rule of law and non-discrimination. And we have to get there within 15 years. Our share of world GDP, our as in European Union, will be halved in 15 years, which means that my former counterparts in the Chinese government will think I'll twice as pompous in 15 years. <laughs> And so we have very little time, actually, to build a trading system that works for me and my children if they ever decide to go into trade. I hope not. I will actually forbid them to. But if they decide to go that route, basically, we have 15 years to set the framework that would work for Korea or that would work for Japan, and where basically the mercantilism and national discrimination is basically an old concept. And this is the reason why, if you look at TTIP, TPP, basically what are they? They're very, very expensive contexts that are extremely difficult to stand out of. It, you will pay a price, an opportunity cost for being outside it. And there is only one reason you would actually create it. It's not a question about isolation. It's a question about sequencing. Let's look at the next chapter behind TPP and TP, uh, TTIP, which is basically where we were promised to arrive after the Uruguay round. We will get there, but with a 30-year delay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And now, Troy, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for your introduction. Um, I agree with much of what uh, Dr. Lee has said, and um, Dr. Hur at the beginning had talked about sort of the connection between security and trade and you know I think you know given that you know the theme of this conference is you know the future of history sometimes it's useful to look back and sort of see where we've come from to actually know what that history is not because it repeats but because it lays the framework for which we're working in now and the current chapter which we've lived in since essentially the end of World War II is most likely coming to an end we are probably living in a transitional transitional period but if we look back you know, why did we get to where we are today? And I'd like to read a quote from uh, the longest serving U.S. Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, um, who served during two world wars. Um, and he said, I saw that you could not separate the idea of commerce from the idea of war and peace. You could not have serious war anywhere in the world and accept, expect commerce to go on as before. And I saw that wars were often caused by economic rivalry. I thereupon came to believe that if we could increase commercial exchanges among nations over lowered trade and tariff barriers and remove international obstacles to trade, we could go a long way towards eliminating war itself. Now, this is probably somewhat idealistic. Um, you know, we've also discussed today the issues of you know, the relationship that Germany and the United Kingdom had before World War I, how despite the strong trade relationship, mm -hmm. it still led to war. But what we're ultimately looking at today is a system that was built in the ashes of war, a system that was designed to take and expand prosperity around the world, a system which, if the United States were being honest, provides benefits to the United States, but ultimately provides more benefits to the other countries in the world. Now, the question becomes, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. And this is sort of what we're going through right now. And, you know, I agree with Dr. Lee, you know, this is not new. If we look back at U.S. trade policy itself, has it always been multilateral and bilateral, but you know, we took and we negotiated the North American Free Trade Agreement of the mid-1990s. One of the things I think people often forget is that on the heels of that trade agreement, uh, the Clinton administration sought to do a free trade area of the Americas. Now, ultimately, that regional agreement didn't move forward, but regional mega trade agreements are not something that are new on the U.S. trade agenda. Under the Bush administration, uh, while a smaller region, we have the Central American Free Trade Agreement, another example of a regional trade agreement. And I think we also need to think about the idea of, you know, what really do we mean by a mega free trade agreement? Um, we've moved beyond the point of simply a question of it being the number of countries, but it's also the size of the partners involved. And so, you know, there are other agreements, and perhaps they're on the lower scale, but the U.S. and the European Union agreements with Korea probably qualify as mega free trade agreements. So this is not necessarily a new venture on either side. 
So the question is, is, you know, why do we pursue these types of agreements? And Dr. Lee's touched on a lot of the points of why we do. Uh, but ultimately, it's because you can utilize each to take and weave them together. When we consider, you know, either TTIP or TPP, what we're looking at is, in essence, efforts by countries to take and move the trade liberalization agenda forward. If we go back to the early part of the Doha development round, the round was focused on the idea of promoting development amongst developing countries. The challenge within that framework is, is that the round became essentially captive to that agenda. But ultimately, trade is not merely a purely economic uh, prospect. It is also a political and a strategic one. And without taking and putting issues related to manufacturing and services on the table to a serious extent to where the negotiations went forward to a large degree on those areas as well, it was difficult for the United States and other countries to move forward on the Doha round. So in essence, multilateral trade became stagnated. And as an alternative, the United States sought out what would be often referred to by economists as the second best alternatives. So as we look at TPP uh, going forward, what we ultimately see is an effort by the United States to take and re-jumpstart the multilateral round. The idea being that you can build momentum in the multilateral sphere by doing regional or large trade agreements. That by taking and pushing the liberalization agenda forward, you can demonstrate what is possible, and you can also create new opportunities, meaning that the countries who are non-FTA beneficiaries realize over time that in order to gain the same benefits and to be as competitive as the countries within the agreements, that they also need to take and be more forthcoming on the multilateral level so that way we can advance trade on a global stage rather than merely on the bilateral level. Now, the question becomes, you know, how beneficial are these trade agreements? And, you know, you'll see lots of debate. And right now in the United States, the debate is centered around the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. It's the most recent one that's in play. And if you look at the results, um, there's two things I think we need to realize. One is that it's early, but two, that the results are mixed. Meaning that if you look at the trade debate, and Chris Nelson and I have had with some colleagues of ours in D.C. sort of a roundabout microcosm of numbers, what you start to see over time is, is that, you know, Right now, we're not seeing necessarily the results we had all hoped for. And so the question becomes, as we move forward to, you know, TPP, to towards TPIP, TTIP, sorry, is, you know, how do we take and address these issues going forward? Some of them is in the invitation process. Some of it is likely, you know, considering the behind the barriers, uh, behind the border barriers more carefully. Uh, we're now living in a world to where, for most countries, many tariffs have been eliminated at very low levels. The real challenge comes in the behind the border measures. There was a study done by the Korea Institute for International Economic Policy to where um, they essentially asked the question of why would the United States and the European Union take and engage in a free trade agreement? Um, you know, essentially, their argument was the United States and Europe both have low average tariff rates. Um, but when you look at essentially the tariff equivalents they calculated, uh, for behind the border barriers, they found that essentially there was a 20 to 90 percent barrier um, built up within trade between the United States and the European Union. So there's significant potential economic benefits simply by removing these barriers, moving to regulatory coherence. And this sort of gets back to the issue of, you know, what Dr. Lee was talking about in his comments, which is that, you know, this isn't simply a question of increased trade flows, but it's also ultimately a question of what type of economic structure we want to live in and what we want the world to look like going forward. And so the question becomes, do we want to continue down a path of liberalization, one which has opened up trade and opened up markets, one which has taken and allowed much of the world to take and lift itself out of poverty and to continue on this path, or do we want to take and choose a different path, one that perhaps is more mercantilistic, one that looks to take and benefit certain countries but at the cost of others. And these are the types of choices we have. Now ultimately, the WTO can play a role in this. The WTO has often been argued that, well, and I think, you know, for people like Fred Bergson have said, you know, if you're not continuing forward, you know, you fall off the bicycle is the analogy they use. I've never quite agreed with that because I felt what you need ultimately is an institutional framework within which all the FTAs and everything work. 
And the WTO provides perhaps the most important part of that, which is the dispute mechanism system. And by having this mechanism in place, it allows you to take and enforce the rules of trade around the world and to do them on an equal, fair, and equitable basis. And so whether we're liberalizing through the multilateral level or whether we're liberalizing on the regional or bilateral level, the two can work together and play an important role. But ultimately, what we're looking for is a rules-based system which allows everyone to compete on an equal basis and to take and allow trade to continue to grow rather than to stagnate over time. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. Okay, finally. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Naoki Yoshino. I'm from Japan. And whenever we are talking about free trade, there are restructuring sectors. And especially in Japan, agriculture is the restructuring sector. And when in the table of negotiation, industrial people are all in favor of free trade because they are very strong and they think they can compete. And in those tables, farmers do not attend. They are always protesting against those free trade. So what I started is how to restructure agricultural sector in Japan. And we are focusing on weak sector and sectors which need to be restructured. Governments always looking at bright sectors and then we will just uh, negotiate without those complaints. And Japanese agriculture has a very interesting history. After World War II, large land road was all destroyed and many small peasants became a landowner. So Japan has created a very equal society. Everybody has a piece of land. Then they started to cultivate very small piece of land. So it's a very inefficient land. However, each people worked very hard to make high quality rice. But even once we opened the those market, then they are very much concerned what to do. So we started to create what they should do. And fortunately, many farmers become very old now, 60 or 65. So they don't want to keep on cultivating their land, but they want to own the land. They want to keep the land as ownership. So last year, we introduced this leasing system of those farmland. So all the farmers can lease those land to young people, and so that younger people can start much bigger scale economy uh, farming and it is gradually starting. Then the next question is, who will lend money to those young farmers? Banks are very reluctant to make loans because it may be very risky. Then we started the so-called hometown investment trust funds. Many people in the region will help those young farmers to have much bigger scale landing. So I think one point important is we have to look at restructuring sector in each country then we have to show how they can make their reform into several years. And negotiation should not be just all of a sudden. It will take time to restructure each, uh, each uh, sectors. So that is one. And secondly, uh, there was mentioning about China. When we are talking about free trade, exchange rate has to be market-oriented. Some country exchange rate is very closely pegged to US dollar, and it's a pegging system. Mm. Then that will affect price of the commodities greatly. So I'm uh, specializing in finance and exchange rate. Many trade people are just looking at the uh, movement of trade, but the exchange rate mechanism is also important. And also capital mobility has to be freely uh, mobilized. China is still controlling capital, then the negotiation of free trade is unfair. So I think the exchange rate and capital control has to go closely together with it. And I did some simulation for Chinese exchange rate. The proposal was it will take three or four years, but they have to change their weight for the US dollar is a very high weight, but it has to be changed to about 0.62. It used to be one to US dollar. And currently, their exchange rate weight is about 0 0.88. But their goal is 0 0.62 from my computation. And Chinese agreed my proposal, and my paper will be published from China in the next month. 
So I think that the not only trade, but also various other factors has to be taken into account. And each country has to watch the restructuring sector and give the information how they can change within several years. And negotiation should not be all of a sudden, but you have to wait for several years so that each restructuring sector can be adopted. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Now we just heard all these different presentations that touch so many different things. I just mm -hmm. don't know how to put it all together into uh, coherent boxes. But let's just start with one question. Uh, I'm glad that there's this uh, view that basically trade issue is in a way a security issue. Uh, that's the history lesson. And trade is very important. And you also mentioned that uh, you know, the question whether you know, we should pursue mega FTA or the multilateral is not the right question. It's just all this depends on your strategic uh, orientation or sometimes it's a sequencing issue. Basically, you, know, you are choosing uh, uh, different type of negotiations depending on your strategic priorities. But my question is this. My first question to all of you is that why are we walking away from the multilateral and increasingly move to the, not bilateral, but this regional or mega FTA? Of course, one reason is, of course, the, as you, some of you mentioned, the Doha round is simply disappointing. It's, it's dead all by the name, right? Mm. But is it just a reflection of the dissatisfaction or is it more fundamental change in the underlying economy? Because it, some of you mentioned, uh, I guess it's Troy, you mentioned about this, not the border, but the behind the border uh, protection. And uh, Dr. Lee also mentioned about this regulatory cooperation, which is different from what we used to have under the gut or these tariff negotiations. So the question is, you know, often people talking about global value chain, and does it have something to do with this emergence of a mega FTA versus the previous type of multilateral rounds? Can anybody venture about this? Can, can I start? Okay. Uh, the, regarding your question, uh, of course, uh, I, I, nobody will say no regarding the balance development uh, between multilateralism and uh, regionalism and whatever uh, for the, the liberalized uh, world economy. Uh, the issue is how. So it, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to, to proceed uh, uh, the conclusion of, uh, of DDA uh, because uh, so many, so many uh, participants, players there, and uh, uh, not like the past, uh, these days, no, no strong. Uh, uh, no, no country with a strong leadership. So, so that's, that's the reality. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to respond to the, the, the comments by uh, Hosek uh, regarding uh, EU. Actually, EU is uh, far, far higher than or more than uh, FDA. Uh, I'm emphasizing uh, when we start uh, negotiation uh, for, uh, for uh, say, mega FTA, uh, there is, uh, I, I haven't seen any, any uh, high quality mega or FTA, RTA, whatever, with more than 10 countries. Uh, in case of uh, EU, you know, we, th they start with uh, six. Uh, members in the 1960s, also at the time uh, EEC or EU had uh, adopted uh, a, a compensation mechanism for losers. So it, it's a very, very, very unique system. So FTA, actually, we do not have a compensation mechanism, so we can't attract additional members. So that's a, that's a big issue. Also, if we look at ASEAN, AFTA, ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. Of course, they have uh, 10 member countries, but uh, AFTA is one of them, um, RTA with the lowest uh, quality. Mm -hmm. So, it should point out when I'm saying, okay, uh, mega FTA could be important in leading uh, global trade rule. The condition is prerequisite is. Um, that mega FTA has uh, high quality uh, contents. Even TPA, TTIP, as he mentioned, 
their basic textbook for their negotiation is Korea, US, FDA. So I presume, definitely, the, the final outlook, uh, final outcome of those FDA could be chorus FDA minus alpha, not <laughs> plus alpha. And the mega FDA, of course, it is too big, too big to fail. But issue is when. I'm saying new future. When, you know, if you look at FTA AP, that's uh, which is uh, APEC FTA. We have uh, we started discussion in 1994, almost 20 years. Nothing here, right? Even in in FTAA, FTA in Americas, led by US. No more talk. So, you know, you should you should underline the difficulties uh, laid behind the, the mega FTA. Okay. Well, I, I would mm. like to but just first say, don't worry. I actually mm. think I think European Union is a joke. So mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then you can imagine what I, I, I think. Know, I know. European <laughs> Union. Right. Then you can imagine what I think about the a ASEAN single market. <laughs> single market. Uh, anyway, so, uh, but it also exemplifies, I mean, w what you can do, um, let's say, in Europe, even in by the uh, mid-70s, we had the principle of something called the Cassis de Dijon, which was a very uh, activist case from the European Court of Justice, which means that basically if you have a product from another jurisdiction, basically you have to let that product in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, according to French law, or actually in this case German law, that product is prohibited. But come on, you know, French people not dying because they drink this liquor carcasses de Jong. So obviously there's something seriously wrong with German law. And we try to, I mean, apply this to the, the concept of, let's say, TTIP. If you think about it, I mean, a, even in an area really sensitive like pharmaceuticals, 80% of all the companies and the drugs that are produced, they are transatlantic. They are co uh, it's basically the same company who's actually the same product twice mm -hmm. to two different jurisdictions. Even in that context where we should be chasing counterfeit, that is the last 20% that comes from Vietnam or what have you, we don't know where even where they come from. We can't do it. Well, we could extend between France and Germany the principle, your laws are pretty, probably okay. We can't do it. When it comes to, for instance, car standards, uh, that's another very good area. You can see that you know, we can't extend that in the uh, EU Japan FTA. And it's not really uh, the common standard setting will not be uh, a topic in T, uh, TPP either in the, the second round of negotiations. And it creates, I mean, um, a false hopes that we will create a common uh, economic area. That, that's not where we are going. Basically, it's about lifting the least common denominator one notch up. And here's the problem. I mean, if you look at the WTO, as Dr. Chung very correctly pointed out, this has never been on the agenda. <laughs> so it's never been a question of either or. We just decided to do the second side of the, the flip side of the coin as well. I would like to emphasize that. And then I would like to just to, just to stress a point about the exchange rates. Uh, I'm a lawyer and an economist, so basically one half of me is agreeing with you, the other half is trying to actually negotiate with you <laughs> um, or put you in jail. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, yeah, it is true. I mean, exchange rate fluctuates more than tariffs. Mm -hmm. So let's be very clear. Is that a cost? Yes. Should we address them in trade agreements? Absolutely not. The reason is if you start to go after basically we are talking about the RMB, let me be very clear. The first casualty of a currency discipline in a trade agreement will be Japan. Of all the lobbies that come to me to lobby, 90% are against Asian countries, in particular Japan. And they are very much dominated by the car industry. And they come to me and say, Japan is unfair. 
Japan is mercantilist, Japan is not democratic, Japan is manipulating its exchange rate. So basically, their argument is that the, whether you're talking about abenomics or something else, uh, basically they are saying that we don't want more Japanese cars in Europe or United States. And that's on the basis of the same principle we are talking about, which is the exchange rate discipline. And be very, very careful about what you ask for. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll yes. go <laughs> I think I'd better answer <laughs> uh, my, my own point. Okay. Uh, exchange rate is determined by all the commodities flow coming in, going out. Japanese manufacturing sectors are very strong, but we have very weak sectors, such as agriculture and other sectors. And that determines the exchange rate supply and demand. And exchange rate in Japan is not intervened at all in these several years. So I think as for the industrial sector, especially manufacturing, the Japanese exchange rate is a little bit weak. But uh, for agriculture and other sectors, the exchange rate is appreciated. So I think uh, that is a mixture. And furthermore, Japanese case, foreign direct investment has substituted a trade dispute. Mm. And Japan has moved from auto industry from Japan to Southeast Asia and other countries as foreign direct investment. And then we have created uh, multinational uh, industries and so on. So I think that, that is another way to uh, cope with the uh, um, yeah, dispute yeah. of their trade. Well, I, I guess please? to try and bring it back a little bit to your initial question of, mm -hmm. you know, why have we gone to these mega FTAs and why, are, mm -hmm. if we have, why have we moved away from the multilateral sector? I mean, you know, one, if we look at the changes since, you know, the end of the Second World War, you know, in the initial, you know, be it, you know, ANSI, Tokyo, or whatever round you want to choose, up until recently, you know, primarily the forces driving trade were the United States, um, the European nations, be it, you know, either specific countries in Europe or the European Union, and Japan. And to a large degree, degree setting aside, you know, specific things, issues we might have on using uh, chlorine on chicken or other things, we had a lot of you know, similar economic development state, similar agendas, and mm -hmm. so we could take and push things forward. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look at the WTO today, um, I don't remember the exact count, but I'm pretty sure it's over 130 countries. Um, not all of them necessarily are, you know, driving policy within the negotiating rounds, but you have the rise of new significant players, be they Brazil, be they India, be they China, you know, South Africa to perhaps a lesser extent who, you know, have a different agenda, see things differently, and it makes things more complicated. You know, whenever you go from having, say, you know, perhaps three entities trying to negotiate something to now six, you've now exponentially increased your difficulty. And it's not as though we're looking at, you know, everyone having the same issue agenda at play. So you have increased complexity within the international system. So the question then becomes, if you have difficulty because of that complexity, how do you overcome that? And one way to do that is to take, and essentially, maybe you could say, you know, back to the future to an extent. Go back, try to negotiate something with like-minded partners, use that as an example of what you can do going forward, and then try to take and integrate that into the multilateral system. Now, you know, we've talked about the question of whether, you know, TTIP and TPP will be much better or maybe even slightly uh, worse than you know, the chorus FTA or the EU Korea FTA. But, you know, I think if we're being practical, if we could get essentially provisions within chorus into the Doha round, that would be a significant step forward. So I think that's where we are, what some of the challenges are uh, right now as we look at why we're looking at these multilateral or, you know, mega FTAs as opposed to, you know, the continuation of the Doha round or something else. What struck me very, uh, uh Surprisingly, is that when, you, when I read most of the economic literature, they are more focused on the changing nature of underlying economy. Why, what I hear from most of you is maybe because some of you have been involved in the actual negotiations, so you appreciate how difficult it is, and they might uh, uh, let you be more realistic or more pessimistic, depending on how you look at it. Like, uh, all you can do is just you know, raise one notch higher, the least common denominator. 
or you are more pessimistic about the convergence of regulatory uh, uh, cooperation. But on the other hand, some people find the rationale for the mega FTA not just because they want to avoid the complexity of all these BRICS countries coming together on board, but rather because they want to talk about something else, WTO plus, like uh, you mentioned briefly about uh, government procurement or investment or IPR, or even in cases like uh, uh, issues in the WTO or deeper WTO. But now what I hear most of from you is more like uh, 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 just the complexity or just the, the realistic expectation that WTO with all these BRICS members and with all the already overburdened agenda cannot uh, in the realistic time frame achieve anything so that you just uh, have no other choice but to go to the mega FTA. Is my assessment correct? There's two different ways of looking at things. One camp is looking at the mega FTA as a chance to add so-called WTO plus issues. And hopefully later, as you mentioned, they can lead to the multilateralization somewhere down the road. Why, on the other hand, the realistic view I hear from some of you is that it's simply because WTO or multilateral is not working. So we try to follow the, the path of least resistance, and that's where we are. Somehow, I guess, we, there's a need to converge this to different point of view. Am I correct in, in spotting yeah. the sense of the discussion over here? Yeah. So the, the sensitive issue in the, in the TPP, which is one of the uh, 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 important uh, uh, mega FT these days, uh, are agriculture, uh, especially between uh, Japan and the United States, and uh, uh, intellectual property right. Uh, this is uh, between uh, advanced economy and uh, developing countries. Uh, as, so issues is, uh, is especially for, is very, very sensitive uh, for Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the, the WikiLeaks uh, uh, uploaded uh, uh, some of uh, of a, a textbook uh, under negotiation, I, I had a chance to look at uh, very carefully regarding uh, the chapters on intellectual property right. Of course, if we look at that, uh, uh, there, are, there are many uh, uh, advanced or new uh, rules or agendas uh, for RPR, but it's a, it's a First, uh, uh, the look at uh, my, my my feeling was um, it couldn't be adopted by member countries. For example, medical services. Oh, it's only United States strongly argue this should be adopted. But all nine, eleven countries no say no. There are many many issues. Only U.S. argue for it. The remaining say no. The other cases. All other countries say yes, U.S. say no. So the issue is, uh, is, uh, is uh, the advanced uh, or new type of uh, rules are proposed by U.S., but the other countries say no. Another risk or uncertainty regarding TPP is uh, uh, current Obama administration uh, hasn't got uh, any, the, what is it, uh, the trade, uh, uh, trade uh, promotion authority from the, the Congress. Yeah. So, you know, the, the other TPP members, uh, they see, see uh, possibility of uh, uh, renegotiation, even they conclude, they signed. You know, yeah, we, we, already, we already seen uh, Korea, USFT, actually we, we uh, negotiate, uh, signed uh, <laughs> Coros FTA twice, right? Mm -hmm. So, so theoretically, we say ah, mega FTA uh, could be a stepping stone for for uh, multilateralism. Oh, definitely in the long term it could happen, but uh, in short term, 
very very pessimistic. I think. Okay. Troy, you want to add something? Yeah, just touch maybe on the issue of TPA and everything. Um, the United States is somewhat unique in that our legislature has the authority to take and negotiate uh, or to essentially mo uh, manage commerce. And so we delegate the authority to our executive branch, but on a limited term basis under certain guidelines. And the Obama administration chose a path of strategically trying to take and negotiate agreements through essentially using the same procedures that had been under the prior TPA to take and move the negotiations along. Now, the challenge we've come into is they may have mistimed when to take and actually seek the actual negotiating authority. So that's left us in a position where it's perhaps difficult to close TPP because many of the countries, while they perhaps may not be as opposed to some of the rules the United States is putting forward, with the prospect that the administration cannot deliver on that agreement because they don't have this, you know, sort of signed and sealed document going forward, it's difficult for other countries to take and commit to that. So, you know, right now, you know, we're in the classic situation. This is one of the things that would hurt in the WTO negotiations is that every key country would be going through an election slightly after the next country, which meant you could never do anything because somebody was always up for re-election. Well, we have our midterm elections coming up. And the thought is, is that after the midterm elections, then the administration can seek trade promotion authority. If that can happen, and you know, if you can take and reach an agreement with Japan, especially on issues like agriculture and autos, you can probably quickly move TPP to conclusion and move it through. But those are some of the key stumbling blocks right now. Mm -hmm. Now, if the United States is not able to get trade promotion authority, or if we're unable to take and resolve our with Japan, then this could go on longer, as you know, we were discussing. I mean, we, uh, Professor John already mentioned from the beginning that uh, it's not quite likely to we see the conclusion of the TPP in the near future, did, including that problem you yeah. know, of the U.S. Uh, prerogative issue. But the question I would like to ask all of you is that right now in Asia, there's a competing deal between TPP and RCEP. Uh, is it really competing or is it something you can you know, simultaneously go together? And if you put yourself in the Chinese shoes, is it in the best interest to join the TPP or stay out of it and pursue RCEP instead? Or if you put yourself in Korea's shoes, what do you recommend regarding these two competing deals? Should we join, pursue both deals together? Or should there should be a sequence? Or if you want to make the equation a little bit more complicated. What about the uh, talk between China, Japan, and Korea? What should be the right sequence? Can you press all of the th three things together? Or are there ideal sequence? No. These that's are the questions that's perhaps that's you can, I can hear your views. That's, a, that's a one of uh, my, my research topics today. Uh, it's, it's a difficult uh, uh, to say now, but uh, uh, the, the regarding your, your question, uh, for the, uh, the China and the Korea's accession to the, the, the TPP or some, some uh, uh, co uh, with uh, RCEP or not. Uh, uh, from, if we look at the uh, current uh, negotiation agenda uh, undergoing in the TPP, Actually, the China, it's very difficult for, for, for China to join the TPP, regardless U.S.'s objection or not, I don't know. Uh, for example, you know, the, even China now, you know, majority of uh, economic activities are state-owned, by state-owned, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they should, they should reform state-owned right now. So it's, it's a... It's a Actually, more than economic reform, actually, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's uh, there are political issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even government procurement, uh, you know, the, uh, China spent a lot of, uh, a lot of la very largest, uh, highest portion of, uh, uh, among, among uh, large economies, uh, portion of their uh, budget uh, in terms of uh, government procurement. So that's uh, at least uh, two. Uh, Two issues could be the biggest burden for, for China to the to the join the uh, TPP. Uh, regarding Korea's position, 
Uh, many, many trade economists uh, or policymakers, they are very in favor of uh, uh, joining TPP. They say uh, we have uh, almost we have uh, eight, uh, ten uh, FTAs with uh, ten member countries uh, out of uh, twelve member countries. So why not now? Also, uh, if we are not participate in the TPP, then uh, we will be isolated from from making global rule, rule, trade rules. It sounds, sounds reasonable, but uh, as I told you before, I'm pretty sure the TPP could be chorus minus alpha. So at least <laughs> regarding trade in rule issues, we, we will not be damaged too much. Uh, second, security issue, it's uh, I'm not a, not a, not a, uh, no, no. But uh, the, at least uh, for 2014, we have uh, much urgent two trade issues. Number one is terrification of rice. So we should terrify uh, rice by end of this year. So far, you know, government they hasn't taken any, not much action for for the liberalization of rice market because we have. Uh, uh, election in June. So after June, maybe three, four months, that will be domestically very, very hot debate. Will politically very difficult for the government, I guess. Okay. Also, another what how, uh, another urgent issue is uh, to to proceed uh, FTA with China. China is Korea's number one trading partner. So. You know, with the limited uh, resources, human resources of trade of uh, steps, uh, manpower, it is not uh, feasible to go together. At, at least, you know, we, we at least we need uh, more than 200 uh, 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 trade negotiating steps uh, for uh, after with China. So, so my my argument is. Uh, it will not be very late uh, if we concede the joining TPP next year, not this year. So also we need to, to our best strategy, I'm saying, wait and to see. Okay. Because there are many uncertainties in the, in the TPP. Okay, uh, I know all of you have a, a comment to make, but we have only 15 minutes. So uh, let's just get the question first and mm -hmm. then take that opportunity to, to say your comments about this issue. Are there any questions from the uh, audience? Please. Um, yes, uh, I'm quite interested in the WTO paradox because uh, it was born to boost free trade and uh, deregulation and it only way to survive is to become some kind of a regulator. And so the question is maybe not uh, WTO versus FTA, but uh, 19th century uh, free trade versus 21st century mm -hmm. fair trade. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? Okay, good question. Anybody else? Any questions? Okay, then I just want to let your panelists to make a comment on my question address. The gentleman's question. Take the opportunity. Well. Um, very quickly, no, it will not happen because it's not in the inherent in the DNA of WTO to become a regulator. <laughs> it, there are no standards in the WTO, and because every agreement basically points to international existing standards, so basically you can build a discipline against discriminatory national standards to say that you, even there is a global standard, you have to use the global standard. So, and also. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, we can't even do ag sub uh, agriculture subsidies in WTO, so see, let, let's wait and see in 2025 if we can even talk about something that's remotely close to technical standards or SPS standards. So having said that, uh, I just want to say it would be delusional to think that TPP will be chorus double plus. But also it's almost delusional to say that it will be a chorus minus 
because these are completely two different type of agreements. But what Korea actually gained is that it, Korea has a, basically an advance of, let's say, 10 years. By negotiating CORUS and the EU-Korea FTA in parallel, I lowered that basically by setting the benchmark of next generation FTA. Korea has actually earned and paid for the right to say, let's wait and see. And that's a sensible strategy because if Korea would join TPP, you would have no leverage to change the course of negotiations anyway. And you would be, be facing the double whammy with you know, renegotiate with the Congress again. So basically, you earn the right to wait and see. And also, what, something that I wanted to pick up, which was the question about the, um, the China issue. Uh, Korea's export to China is about 20% of Korea's GDP. And now you can see, I mean, from a European perspective, we would dream about these numbers. But from Korea's perspective, it has a certain security issue because it's not the question it's China. It's just a question about the Chinese custom is unpredictable. If 20% of your export is depending on basically what the Chinese customs think or feel or moff, which side of the bed Mofcom gets out of in the morning, basically your trade could stop on Monday. And which means that by Tuesday, you know, when the housewives cannot go shopping anymore, one third of the Korean economy could come to a grid. It won't happen because Chinese have very good economies, much better than Europe, by the way. But, <laughs> but it also has created, these two FTAs have created policy space for Korea to negotiate CJK. To say, actually, we, 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 can, we, can, we can actually relax now. We can pursue China, and we can pursue market access in China without security concerns. And that's basically where this agreement comes in, the question about CJK. Mm -hmm. And CJK, to be honest, is a down payment for RCEP. Without CJK, there will be no RCEP. Without okay. the single market in, um, in, in ASEAN, there won't be no RCEP. And which is basically to say there will be no RCEP. And, um, yeah, and so that's also uh, another question, which comes to the question about the Korean-Japan trade relationship, which is not an easy question, especially for Korea. Uh, I understand that the, the, the rounds of negotiation have been going on for, uh, I don't know, is it a six yeah, round? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's just there is no benefit in there for Korea. Uh, and so I can understand that it's not going anywhere at this point. I would agree with the skepticism on RCEP. I mean, setting aside the challenges of you know, the Korea, China, Japan triangle, um, you know, you have the issue of India once again, um, you know, ASEAN. So, you know, you have a lot of countries who will say, I guess, in diplomatic parlance, are looking for flexibility, mm -hmm. and that flexibility will take and lead to, you know, a less open agreement, if you will. And so, <laughs> the question is, is you know. Not even can they get an agreement, but will it be an agreement that is worth getting at the end of the day? Um, so I think you know, RCEP isn't necessarily a challenge. I think there's no reason for any of the countries not to, who are in both RCEP and TPP not to pursue both at the same time. I mean, there's no great loss in doing that. It really just comes down to you know, is, you know, capacity issues basically. Mm -hmm. Do you have the negotiators mm -hmm. and everything? And mm -hmm. um, if you do, great. If the two agreements aren't being negotiated simultaneously, then that works out as well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm skeptical on RCEP, mm -hmm. but I don't see reason not to do both. Okay. Yeah. As far as China is concerned, I think there are two issues. One is there are two groups of the people in China about exchange rate and capital control. One group wants to make renminbi as international currency. If they want to do so, exchange rate has to be freely fluctuated and capital flow has to be freely mobile. And another group of the people wants to keep the growth rate of China as much as 8%. And they are strongly thinking relatively fixed exchange rate is important to keep their economy is in growing. So uh, which side of the people will win? And I think maybe internationalization has to do be done so I think gradually the exchange rate will become uh, a normal level, three, four years. But one more thing is SOE, state-owned enterprises. Everybody knows government-owned enterprises are much inefficient compared to private. But that is also related to a political issue, uh, whether government will move to a market-oriented economy or not. And if both will succeed, China, Japan, and Korea 
becomes much more easy to make trade agreement. Uh, Chris, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, Chris Nelson, um, Nelson Report. I'm a, a Democrat and a sort of a free trader, so, but to talk about economics is, is silly. But I wanted to make uh, two quick points. Professor Lee is exactly right uh, about currency. Stay away from it. If you start passing currency legislation, you start letting the U.S. Congress start to le try to legislate other people's exchange rates, mm -hmm. oh my God, uh, don't do it. Even though what you're saying makes perfectly rational sense. That's uh, Bush's dream. <laughs> yeah, Jesus. You know, Fred Bergstrom's uh, study from eight or nine years ago, about 30, 40 percent, you know, it, it, there's not a shred of truth to it that anybody can discern, but it gets repeated as holy. It, it, it literally, Moses handed that one down. That's how important it is on Capitol Hill, number one. Number two, uh, Troy and I have had this conversation going on with Lori Wallach of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Public Citizen for a couple of years now. The American trade debate isn't really much about trade. It's a political debate about income inequality and the role of globalization and the destruction of the industrial middle class, the loss of blue collar, non-college educated, well-paying jobs that created the America we all know and love after World War II, that's been wiped out by mechanization, computerization, globalization, a lot of things. It's not a dirty commie plot, it's just happened. And we haven't adjusted to it psychologically and politically. And that's the kind of discussion and debate you're seeing in Congress. Well, my God, when you're having that kind of a debate about the very nature of what our, of the social contract in America, it, 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 can the American dream exist anymore uh, for, for working class people? Uh, is it even a relevant th question to ask? You know, that's what we're actually talking about. So the, the, you know, trade is the last thing that actually is being really debated. And when you do see a trade debate, it's, uh, nobody ever uses the same information base or the same uh, studies or any other damn thing. They just use something that they think makes their point. So uh, uh, I'm not sure what the point is to, uh, to the discussion today, except to say uh, when you're looking at what's happening in Congress, uh, 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 a lot of it is process procedural stuff. Uh, you've got, we, we're going to have a, we have a new chairman of Senate Finance for a few months anyway, and then we'll probably have another new set of Republican chairman next year. Uh, he he's talking about the kind of stuff that Sandy Levin is talking about, which is increasing the congressional role in management of trade policy mm -hmm. and management of trade negotiations. Well, you know, as a journalist and a kind of and a, a, a believer in the democratic process, that's wonderful. But my God, as negotiators and economists, you, you, know, uh, you really want everybody in the room negotiating these things? You know, you know, that's the kind of, of discussions we're having. It's not really about trade. Mm -hmm. yeah, and just okay. to briefly add to what Chris said, I mean, you know, in the United States, you face the challenge of, and you'll get the common phrase sometimes of, you know, we're losing jobs to China because of NAFTA, to which you're like, last time I checked, China was not in North America, so. <laughs> You know, you have these these broader problems, and you know, I, and Chris and I, when we've done this, you know, I've looked at some of the trade numbers, and you know, when you boil down, you know, the size of you know some of the agreements in turn relative to the U.S. economy and everything, and if you look at, and let's assume that you know the opponents are 100 percent right about the deficits and everything, and that you know in NAFTA, you know, the oil factor doesn't matter and everything, even though it's about half of our deficit in NAFTA. Um, you know, you're still talking about basically, you know, such a small number that it comes down to like, you know, less than a percent of the U.S. economy. And so the problems of job creation in the United States are not because of one trade agreement that ultimately a trade deficit equals like less than a percent of the U.S. economy. So, you know, we're not really having a debate over whether these agreements are good or bad or how they help or what they do, because ultimately at the end of the day, all a trade agreement is is a tool to take and do something. If either government policy isn't aligned properly or if the business community is not well informed or doesn't choose to use the tool. That doesn't mean the tool's a bad tool, it just means it's not being used properly. And so we're not having these kinds of debates about how the U.S. economy is structured, what we need to do going forward, and then the role trade policy plays in that. And that role is not the preeminent role at the end of the day. It's not going to take and create, you know, tens of thousands or tens of millions of jobs rather or destroy tens of millions. It's simply, it's an ancillary part of the policy. Okay, thank you very much. I think we can go on forever, but basically the time is up. So thank you very much for this distinguished panelist, and thank you very much for the audience. Thank you.